Uh, it has been a long 22 months. Welcome. I'm Alexander Rose, the executive director here at Long Now, and now I have a beard. I look like this. Um, it's been, like I said, a long 22 months. Um, I'm so glad that this is a talk that we really get to come back with. And, and Neil Stevenson has been a, a very long time fellow traveler with Long Now. And I, I was reading his books even before I started with Long Now 25 years ago. And uh, they're always some of the most evocative ways to look at the future. He has this kind of amazing prophetic ability to take a piece of technology and then push it into the future and see the way that's going to affect society. And tonight, in, in, in lieu of trying to ruin this book for you, we're actually going to talk about one of those types of technologies that is um, in part of, the, of this next book. We're actually going to kind of take a look at it from a scientific point of view that um, I think is going to be an interesting lesson, the way we look at thousands of years in the past and thousands of years in the future, uh, especially around climate change. So welcome, Neil Stevenson. Normally, when I do a reading, I read from my own book for obvious reasons. But this time, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to quote from some fascinating books written by other people. And as I do, I'm going to flash the covers up on the screen to give due credit to the authors and so that you can follow up if you want to read more on your own. In 536 AD, the Byzantine historian Procopius was in Italy describing a year without a summer. During the whole year, the sun gave forth its light without brightness like the moon, and it seemed extremely like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it emitted were not clear like those it usually makes. John of Ephesus reported similar phenomena in the eastern part of the empire. The sun darkened and stayed covered with darkness a year and a half. Although rays were visible around it for two or three hours a day, they were as if diseased with the result that fruits did not reach full ripeness. All the wine had the taste of reject grapes. John Lydus, a Byzantine official, posited a physics-based explanation for the anomaly. The sun becomes dim because the air is dense from rising moisture, as happened in the course of the recently passed 14th indiction, which is to say 535 and 536, for nearly a whole year. Cassiodorus at the same time wrote, how strange it is, I ask you, to see the sun, but not its usual brightness, to gaze on the moon, glory of the night at its full, but shorn of its natural splendor. We are all still observing a sun as blue as the sea. We marvel at bodies that cast no shadow at midday and at the force of strongest heat reduced all the way to the impotence of extreme mildness. And this is not the brief absence of an eclipse, but as one that has taken place for nothing short of almost the whole year. We have had a winter without storms, a spring without mildness, a summer without heat. There was no way that these writers could have known it, but the events they were describing were triggered by two or three massive volcanic eruptions elsewhere in the world that all happened to occur in a <clears throat> span of a few years, beginning around 536. One might have been in Iceland, another somewhere in the tropics, and one was definitely at Ilopango in what's now El Salvador. Uh, Ilopango alone produced 87 cubic kilometers of ejecta and had devastating effects on the Mayans. At the same time, up in Scandinavia, a culture was dying out. This was a precursor culture to what we later called the Vikings, Historians have debated why this culture waned and disappeared, and there were probably a number of reasons, but it couldn't have helped that in a part of the world that was already famous for cold weather and marginal agriculture, they got hit with a series of incredibly cold winters. No direct accounts survive, but the Nordic <coughs> cultures that arose afterwards may have preserved some cultural memory of the event in their stories. For them, the end of the world would come not in fire but in ice, a terrible winter called the Fimble Winter, or the Mighty Winter. So here's a passage from the Edda. First of all, that a winter will come called Fimble Winter. Then snow will drift from all directions. There will then be great frosts and keen winds. The sun will do no good. There will be three of these winters together and no summer between. Another Eddic poem, the Seeress's Prophecy, states, 
Black become the sun's beams in the summers that follow. Weather is all treacherous. The sun starts to blacken. As the sun vanishes, the stars fall into the sea where their heat raises a great steam that covers the sky. The Finnish Kalevala contains the following. What wonder blocks out the moon? What fog is in the sun's way that the moon gleams not at all and the sun shines not at all? Parenthetically, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out what's probably obvious to all of you, which is that these legends of anomalous long winters that change the course of human destiny are, of course, fundamental to George R. R. Martin's song of ice and fire, AKA Game of Thrones. <laughs> Doom by Neil Ferguson catalogs several post-volcanic winters. An eruption in Peru in 1600 was followed by severe winters in Scandinavia and a famine in Russia. A 1640 eruption in Japan led not only to cold summers and failed harvests in its vicinity, but droughts in Greece, Egypt, India, and other places. After the 1783 eruption of Laki, a volcano in Iceland, Benjamin Franklin wrote of a constant fog over Europe and parts of North America. The Mississippi froze at New Orleans and the resulting food shortages, some historians believe, helped touch off the French Revolution. 1816 was called the year without a summer because of the eruption of Tambora in Indonesia. It and the earlier Laki eruption in Iceland are basically tied for the modern record. Each put about 110 million tons of sulfates into the air. The Long Now Foundation owns property that's home to a number of ancient bristlecone pine trees. Researchers have been able to sample these and use tree ring analysis to see how the growth rate varied from year to year as a result of changes in weather. Sometimes the effects are obvious enough that anyone can just see them by looking at a slice of the wood, but there are also special staining techniques that can make the changes more obvious. 2036 BCE was apparently marked by a large volcanic eruption that left a clear discontinuity in the sample on the left. The sample on the right shows a couple of anomalous years around 1419 BCE. You can identify them from the blue fringes in the staining. Here's a plot of tree ring data. What's being plotted here is the thickness of the rings, which gives you an idea of growing conditions year by year. A higher value suggests a better growing season. A low value suggests that the weather was bad. I've superimposed some vertical red lines showing the dates of some of the big eruptions mentioned in Neil Fergus's book. Some of the big drops are observable in years following some of the big eruptions, notably Lombok, Indonesia, which is the leftmost one, and the one in Peru. But in other cases like Laki, there's not much of a change so this is kind of interesting in, in that you don't always see a, a strong one-to-one -one correlation between these eruptions, these volcanic events, and weather in a particular part of the world. There's a global effect, but those effects are uh, distributed just because of the complexity of atmospheric physics. Here's a similar chart. In the lower part of the chart, you're seeing two plots, a bunch of spikes drawn in black which are telling you the amount of volcanic aerosols in the atmosphere. So for example, there's a super high spike in the late 1200s. This group here is probably Tambora around 1816. This one here is probably Laki, and so on and so forth. So then the blue line is showing how much the temperature is thought to have deviated from average. And again, the correlations aren't always perfectly one for one. We see a big drop uh, after Tambora, uh, down here, but there's other cases where nothing seems to happen. At the other end of the 19th century, Edvard Munch painted this famous masterpiece. The dramatic red sky in the background is open to interpretation, of course, but the painting was made not long after the eruption of Krakatoa, which depressed temperatures all over the world and created spectacular sunsets like this one for a couple of years afterwards. In the 1960s, yet another eruption in Indonesia put a plume of ejecta into the atmosphere. The Australians got a plane in the air to take samples. When it landed, they noticed a deposit on the windscreen. One of the Australian scientists licked it and reported that it was painfully acid. 
a more sophisticated analysis found <laughs> that it was sulfates, sulfuric acid, basically. In 1991, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines, it was possible to gather a lot more scientific data beyond the now familiar uh, empirical uh, sensations of depressed global temperatures and brilliant sunsets. This is all quite well understood. When sulfur dioxide is injected into the stratosphere, it combines with available water to form sulfuric acid, which drifts around in the form of a very large number of tiny droplets. When such a droplet is struck by light from the sun, some of the light will bounce back into space. So it never reaches the troposphere, which is where weather happens, and it can't warm up the planet. Some of the light will be deflected sideways. This contributes to a general brightening of the sky that explains the beautiful sunsets as well as some of the mysterious atmospheric phenomena described by those Byzantine and Scandinavian sources as well as Benjamin Franklin himself. And some of the light keeps going down and continues to warm the earth as usual. This keeps happening for a couple of years, which is how long it takes for the sulfates to wash out of the atmosphere then everything goes back to normal. Sulfates have remarkable leverage against global temperatures. The amount of sulfates needed to cool down the earth by one or two degrees simply isn't that large. It's easy to imagine engineered delivery systems that would duplicate what volcanoes have done many times in the past. High altitude tanker planes, high altitude balloons, and big guns have all been mentioned. This kind of thing goes under the name solar geoengineering. It's a perfectly well-known concept among scientists who study these things, but it doesn't get talked about much because it's controversial. <laughs> Unfortunately, the CO2 level in the atmosphere keeps on rising regardless. This is a screen grab from just a few days ago showing that the current level is about 414 parts per million. That's up from 411 in the last year. The graph on the lower right just happens to begin around the time I was born. <clears throat> and uh, it shows that just during my lifetime, it's gone from below 320 parts per million to almost 420. And if you look at the shape of that curve, not only is it going up, which means that the problem's getting worse, but it's got a little upward curve to it, indicating that the pace at which it's getting worse is accelerating. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, this number was in the mid-200s. Today, it's the highest it has been since a few million years ago when the world had a completely different climate. Various governments have announced plans to cut back on carbon dioxide emissions. China, for example, is saying that by 2030, their emissions will level off. In other words, if they do that and every other country in the world does likewise, the CO2 level will, at that point, become a mere linear function of time. It'll still be going up at an impressive rate, but the rate itself won't be increasing. This <laughs> plot will no longer have that slight upward curve. It'll just be a straight ramp angling upwards. By something like 2060 or 2070, it's hoped that the world economy might reach net zero carbon emissions. This doesn't solve the problem. It'll turn this curve into a flat horizontal line. If the CO2 level in the atmosphere is, say, 500 parts per million in 2070, it'll remain at 500 until natural processes can bring it back down again, which is expected to take on the order of a million years. There are a lot of ways in which this is bad, but perhaps the most serious threat that we can expect to see materialize in coming years is that of so-called wet bulb disasters in which temperature and humidity both get so high as to make the survival of humans a physical impossibility. Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future opens with a harrowing depiction of one such event in India. That all sounds pretty bad and like the kind of thing that a well-ordered society would mount an effective response to, but we're at the end of almost two years of a global pandemic in which a significant fraction of people refuse to believe in the very existence of a disease that's killing people all around them in the hundreds of thousands. So from all of this, it's completely obvious that the human race is gonna to have to build carbon capture technologies on an incredibly massive scale. If you think of this in terms of all the coal mines that have been hollowed out of the Earth's crust, all of the petroleum deposits that have been drained, 
all of the forests and peat bogs that have been burned. Basically, we have to fill those back up again with stable carbon-containing compounds that we'll have to manufacture. We'll need to do it fast. It'll be by far the largest engineering project in the history of the world. I believe that we will do it, and that 100 years from now, this problem will have been solved. Atmospheric CO2 levels will be back to where they were before the Industrial Revolution. That's the good news. The bad news is that it's going to take decades, and during that time, we're going to begin seeing disastrous events, such as the one depicted in the Ministry for the Future. On those rare occasions when people talk about solar geoengineering at all, it's conventional to describe it as an idea that's on the extreme fringe and that deserves to be there because it seems so dangerous. Much more research is needed, is the usual conclusion. I do wonder whether it will continue to seem all that dangerous a decade or two down the road when climate disasters are leading directly to mass fatalities particularly given the fact that nature has already performed the experiment for us on several occasions, and we know that the sulfates naturally wash out of the atmosphere in a couple of years. Danger is always relative. Jumping out of a moving car is dangerous, but people will do it anyway if the car is about to go over a cliff. So in my book, Termination Shock, an individual billionaire constructs a large gun that shoots sulfur into the stratosphere, simulating what volcanoes do. This is already a fait accompli at the beginning of the story, and so what it's mostly about is how people react to it. Needless to say, not everyone is happy. <laughs> Just to give some sense of scale, the amount of sulfur that this fictional gun is capable of launching over the course of a year's continuous operation is only about 1% of what Mount Pinatubo put into the air explosively. But in his mind, it's just a pilot project, and the plan is to build more such facilities in other parts of the world. And uh, that is the setup for a kind of geopolitical uh, thriller that is, is essentially the story of those who, uh, those who are happy about this plan and those who are extremely unhappy. So uh, with that, I think we can shut the uh, projector down and, uh, and go to the Q&A mode. Thanks. Thank you. I think the the, um, the setup of the of a rogue billionaire doing geoengineering is. Do you, do you, how likely do you think it is that a, a a person will do it versus a government? I think is just a, a fun way to do the story. Or? It's a fun way to do the story. Yeah, I think I have to to do some work in the the story explaining how this guy is able to get away with it. Uh, but having it be an individual. Um, makes for kind of better storytelling. Um, realistically, uh, I, I think it would be a pretty hard caper to, to pull off. So um, what, what I kind of think is more realistic is that at some point, especially if we start seeing these wet bulb events or other mass casualty uh, disasters, that some government somewhere is going to run the numbers on this and say, you know, uh, we don't care what anyone thinks of us. Uh, this is this is going to be a good deal for our country, uh, and so we're going to go ahead and do it. It's interesting. I think that, that you're right that at the conclusion of all these conversations, people say we need to do more research. Yeah, but they're not really doing it. Well, not only that, but a lot of times when people do try to start research programs, they get shot down um, because even doing research. Uh, is viewed as being being uh, beyond the pale. Yeah, even when I think when David Keats spoke here, we had about twenty people here th thinking uh, that he was doing that aerosols in the atmosphere, you know, for brain control and yeah, and, and that whole thing. So it's, it quickly yeah. goes sideways. Yeah, yeah, they they they're getting it, and they're in a crossfire from environmentalists on the left and from people on the right who think it's all associated with chemtrails. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, how did you get going down this path? What was your impetus for for starting down this? Um, I had been kind of tracking it for for a while, uh, and um, you know, it's kind of an inherently interesting science fictional topic. You know, the notion of volcanoes having these these huge effects on human destiny, and particularly the uh, the, the how, what a mystery it was to like the the Romans. I mean. 
they had no way of knowing that a big volcano had blown up in El Salvador, right? right. So to them, there's just something happened. Act and, of God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's that, uh, and then I've, I've brushed up against a few people looking at sort of cloud brightening and other uh, uh, space-based uh, solar geoengineering, which means putting stuff at L1 between the Earth and Sun to block some of the Sun's light. Um, so it's an idea that's been in the air, haha, for a little while. Um, and uh, I just kind of reached a point uh, in 2019 where I thought, you know, if not now, when? Uh, I'm supposed to be a guy who writes books about um, technical subjects, and, you know, why, why haven't I tackled this one yet? And so if we use one of these technologies to potentially shade the planet, there's still other effects of things like the CO2 precipitating into the oceans, and yep. it's just kind of a stopgap. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, anyone who studies this at all will, will, will admit that right off the bat, that um, the real problem is the CO2. And even if the, the, uh, the warming effects of CO2 could be counteracted, uh, through some intervention like this, um, you'd still have ocean acidification and other um, nasty uh, byproducts of, of too much CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so, um, so the only way to, to, to think about this is as like applying a tourniquet um, you know, while the, the patient is transported to the hospital. Um, and You've, you've changed your writing styles over the years, you know, go, going back all the way to your, first there was the command line essay, and then uh, with your Baroque cycle, or are you, have you found a thing that you're now doing, or you continue to do it, changing it for different books? Uh, it's, it's always a little different. Um, I, I think uh, um, there's kind of a, a, a one way of writing things when it's a kind of contemporary action, you know, thriller type of book like Reem D or... Or, uh, or termination shock, and then um, uh, you, you know different styles to simply dovetail with with different uh, kinds of books. I mean, I had a lot of fun sort of copying the 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 sort of uh, the seventeenth century English writing style in the, the Baroque cycle because it's bombastic and they they capitalize letters at random and uh, <laughs> they italicize things. Uh, and, um, uh, and it's just kind of hilarious to read. <laughs> and, the, and, then, and also the, your methodologies, right? You, I think you started handwriting back uh, at the Baroque Cycle. Is that still yep. something you're doing? Yeah, I'm still, still doing that. Um, uh, there have been a couple books since then where they, that got started on, um, uh, on a word processor. <laughs> and, um, and so I just kept doing them that way. But for the most part, I do all original composition with fountain pen on paper. So this whole book was written? In yeah. Big yeah, I, 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 realized, uh, I realized before I uh, uh, just came on stage here that I had forgotten to post my picture of the stack, which is about, about that high for the manuscript for this book. And I'm sure uh, this is a slightly painful subject at this point, but with the advent of meta and all that, and, and the, how, where, where you started with this, but do you, do you have some, some thoughts as to the, the way this is coming back at you? Well, it's very weird. Uh, it's very weird, but um, the, uh, I mean, people have been um, sort of uh, poking at the idea of the metaverse since the book came out and have come up with various uh, visions of what it could look like and ways to implement it. Um, and so, um, but nothing like uh, Facebook <laughs> changing its name to Meta and announcing that they're now a Metaverse company. So we're followed immediately by uh, Microsoft and Disney, two other companies you may have heard of, um, saying that they too are Metaverse companies. Um, Epic is a metaverse company. There's a lot of metaverse companies out there. Um, so uh, um, it, uh, it doesn't, doesn't bring me anything except a, you know, weird, uh, annoying uh, you know, contacts on, on social media. But, um, uh, and, and probably it probably sells a few more copies of, of Snow Crash. Uh, so that's not all bad, but... Um, um, <laughs> 
Nice. And uh, I mean, one of the other uh, thing that I work with your daughter and uh, your son-in-law on is the clock project. They've been engineers on the on the project since since the beginning. So it's been really great. Uh, kind of, it's become a, a family business. Yeah. Uh, and working with them, so it's been really fun. Um, the I think, and on that subject, you, you you sent in one of the earliest clock ideas when I I think first met you almost 25 years ago. Yeah, and I wonder if you could ex talk about that a little bit because I thought it was one of the more fun ideas that we played around with. And, yeah. and in ways we're actually doing some version of it for the for the clock. It was um, it was uh, during the run up to uh, the the turn of the millennium, and I think Long now wanted to to put the the the, the clock was still just kind of. Uh, just getting started, and so to observe the the turning over of the odometer at 2000, the idea was to to put up at least some visions of what the clock might look like. And so uh, uh, Danny and others asked um, a few people to just sort of uh, draw up their ideas of what it might look like. Um, and I had been thinking uh, about um, about kind of reading the newspaper every day and. Um, uh, you know, getting this constant stream of information. Um, and um, it, was it really uh, was it really that important to read it every day? or be, because at the end of the year, they always publish a year end roundup of the news, right? And then at the end of the decade, they 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 published the you know the the decade roundup. And in uh, at, at that time, they were starting to prepare their end of century and end of millennium. You know, news roundups. So you know, the Norman Conquest, and you know, um, you know, all these other things. Uh, and um, and so it just got me thinking, like, what if you actually structured your life around that, so that you would make a decision that you were only going to get an update of the news once a year, or w once every ten years, or whatever. And so uh, that produced the idea of monastic orders that would kind of take a vow. To that effect, and they would live in a, a set of, uh, at the time I drew it as concentric uh, rings with walls and, and gates that would open under clock power every year or every 10 years or every 100 or 1,000 years. Um, and when they were open, you could pass through the gate. You, know, you could leave if you wanted, or you could go in deeper you know, and become an even more uh, isolated uh, person. Um, so that was the uh, that was what I sketched out, and I think it's probably still up on the Long Now site somewhere. Um, and then that became the basis of, of my novel Anathem, with with a lot of elaboration and, and variation. Let's see. All right, from Alec V, we have a uh, could. VR, AR, metaverse be used to simulate the problem and make it feel more real. Um, I, I'm assuming you mean about uh, climate change mm. and things like that. I think it could be a great display mechanism to, uh, I mean, you, you can't um, really get a grip on what one of these interventions might do until you perform a simulation. Um, and we have got pretty good software now for, uh, for for running climate simulations uh, and um, and and seeing how effects are geographically distributed and and that's that's kind of the basis of the book because if you look at one of these simulations you see you might see a, a splotch somewhere in 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 India or Africa or or, or America where there would be a, a, a severe drought um, or or massive flooding. Um, and so that kind of spatial data is really important uh, in thinking about these these problems and these interventions. And and AR VR is a good way to display that stuff. Um, unfortunately, it would only work on people who already believe in the existence of human caused climate change, and anyone else would would dismiss it out of hand as you know communist propaganda. Um, so I'm not sure if it would help with that part of the, the problem. And uh, Peter asks, um, do, you, do you think it's truly inevitable that we're gonna deploy some of this kind of solar geoengineering? I wouldn't say anything's inevitable, but um, I think it's under discussed right now in, in our discourse around climate change um, because it is sort of a taboo 
idea, and um, and 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 so I, I think it it's okay to bring it out into the open and talk about it more, um, because uh, sooner or later, um, again, if you read if you read the opening chapter of Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future which is typically for him a meticulously researched and carefully drawn uh, account of one of these disasters. It doesn't take more than one or two of those to, to get a government thinking about uh, some kind of intervention. Um, so I do think that um, um, it's gonna get talked about and maybe gonna get done in, in, in some parts of the world that aren't quite so, um, um, so meticulous about uh, self-censorship. <laughs> I mean, it's, like it's, it's very interesting how that conversation around geoengineering creates so much um, controversy when fundamentally we are geoengineering the planet and have been right. now for hundreds of years. But yep. it's, it's kind of one of those things. It's also Revive and Restore has had this issue of, you know, if you know, we've been extincting species right. for thousands of years, but the moment you are purposeful in bringing one back, people get... They start using oh, this phrase, you know, oh, unintended we, consequences a lot. Yeah, those the, we can't we can't have those ferrets coming back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, it, yeah. No, it is a, an odd um, kind of uh, hab habit of thought that that we've got into, and I know why. It's the it's the precautionary principle, and the, the precautionary principle is there for good reasons. You know, we we screwed a bunch of stuff up, um, but um, but yeah. Uh, one of the great things about Charles Mann's books, 1491, 1493, is the completely nuking the the idea that that there was a such a thing as pristine nature. Um, you know, we, even uh, indigenous peoples um, all over the world uh, were were geoengineering their uh, their ecosystems and their climate for tens of thousands of years uh, before the first uh, settlers even showed up. Yeah, so it seems to be fine to do geoengineering haphazardly, but yeah. if we do it with intention, then then we all of a sudden have to have a big discussion about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, Anna Marie uh, is asking. It's, it's, it sounds like you believe that in a hundred years we will have su successfully sequestered enough carbon, but it, I, she's wondering. I think why do you why do you have so much hope? Is it just because we have to? Because we have to. Yeah. Yeah, and. Um, and I, I think once it gets rolling and we find processes that'll that'll work, that it'll um, it'll become a thing that people are excited about and that people want to 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 take part in. Um, and you know, we just it it's a thing that has to be done. We have Shane asking, uh, what 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 are you reading these days? And do you read fiction or nonfiction for the most part? I mostly read um, uh, nonfiction. I mostly read read history. Books. Um, so um, I, I did finally. I, I postponed buying and reading the Ministry for the Future because I knew it was out there, and I wanted to, to finish my book first. Um, so this, so that's definitely on my my bedside table now. And um, for you know, as a guilty pleasure, I read the the fantasy novels of Joe Abercrombie. Uh, He's got about nine of those things out now, and they're they're amazingly good reads. Um, and then um, a, a bunch of a bunch of history. The so some of the books that I mentioned, um, the Fate of Rome, uh, is a particularly amazing book. Uh, it basically looks at the, what happened to Rome through the lens of both climate change and pandemics, um, and how those two interacted. So the the, the part I didn't read about the 536 uh, eruptions and the cold weather that followed uh, is that that cold snap effectively opened a channel by which bubonic plague was able to escape from its reservoir in Central Asian marmot colonies and make it out to the Mediterranean and led to the Justinian plague, which he gives a spectacular description of. I mean... Um, Yersinia pestis, man, that is one seriously bad actor. And now we don't, you know, we've got antibiotics that can control it. And so we kind of underrate it, you know, 
but um, it was almost fifty percent of the known population yeah, of the world was yeah, killed during yeah, that time. Yeah. yeah, and 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 in its when it when it really gets rolling and and it just gets transmitted through the air, you know, people would would begin to experience symptoms and be dead within an hour or two. Uh, just unbelievable uh, bad stuff, and but it's it's bottled up in certain areas un, until the temperature. Uh, changes in such a way that enables uh, the vectors of it to, to escape. So, so that's a, a great book to read. That Children of Ash and Elm, a totally new history of the Vikings, is another one that I enjoyed very much. Nice. Um, well, Le Leon is asking uh, if you could share more about why you find the Comanche species preservation so important, but I guess I also without ruining the part of the book about this. So. Oh, well, I mean, I mean there's, there's, a, there's some, some Comanche-related content in the, in the book. Um, it's not too much of a spoiler. Uh, it, it happens in, in West Texas. ComancheEagle.org is, is ostensibly a raptor uh, rescue center. So like a lot of places like that, you go in and you'll see eagles and hawks and so on that, that have been kept alive, they, who, that were shot by a hunter or something. Maybe they can't fly, uh, but... They're, they're being fed and kept kept alive uh, at this place, and they can make new, you know, the, the parts of them involved in making new eagles still work. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so there's that, but, but these people also have, have, are doing a great job of preserving uh, old photos and records, and, and I'm going to use the word artifacts, uh, like uh, weapons and, and other uh, items. Um, uh, that are um, that that tell the the story of that that people, which is a really interesting and unusual group of of, of people. I I won't try to go any deeper than that. But uh, even among Native American tribes, they they've got a really unusual story. And uh, Adam is asking um, what your favorite type of carbon capture or storage technology that you're seeing now is. You know, um, the tough part is the scale that it has to work on. So there's, <clears throat> there's some dialogue in the book where the TR is saying that the amount of carbon we have to remove from the atmosphere, if you just turn it into carbon black and made a pile of it, would be the size of Mount Rainier. It would be about 30 cubic miles of solid carbon. Um, and so... Um, I remember looking at some an idea I thought it was cool a few years ago, and you know, like we were researching it and talking about it, and you know, oh well, maybe we should try this, and then actually bothered to run the numbers and and came to grips with the fact that um, it wasn't big enough. I mean, there's no way. As as uh, uh, recently, a friend of mine dropped out of uh, JPL to start a carbon capture company, and his comment was, we're going to need a lot of fans. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, somehow you have to filter all of the air from yeah. much of the atmosphere through yeah. this device. Right, yeah. right, yeah. The scale is pretty massive. Uh, so, um, yeah, because it's very dilute, that's the problem. It's, it's all over the world. There you can't, it's not concentrated anywhere. It's perfectly distributed all over the... The, the world, um, and it's, um, it's not present in high concentrations. It's only, only 400 and some parts per million. So that's a, that's a really hard problem to solve. So I, I think my favorite technology hasn't even been invented yet, but, but people are working on it hard. I think one of the questions here, I think, with, with this type of technology, like geoengineering, is, is how does this become accepted um, in the world? And I think one of the interesting things, obviously, that science fiction plays this role is a way of playing something out like this so that it can then be kind of more accepted with another generation, whether or not it's, it's our generation. Do you see, you've, you've made some efforts in trying to make some large positive uh, versions of science fiction rather than just dystopic. Do you... Where do you think mm. where do you think your role is and other science fiction authors' role in, in kind of playing out positive versus dystopic features? Um, well, I, I I think the important thing is to to um, to allow for some some ambiguity uh, and not try to go full dystopian or 
or utopian, uh, because readers seeing that will, I think, sense that, oh, hang on a sec, that's not ever how it really is. Um, and so um, <clears throat> what I've tried to do in the case of, of termination shock is to, you know, to, to just show this system being built by this guy as kind of the, that's the, the opening. That uh, takes a while to get to it, but that's essentially already happened at the beginning of, of the book. And then um, rather than trying to portray that as a dystopian or a utopian uh, behavior, uh, show how different people respond to it. Um, and so in, in this book, there are some people uh, from low-lying uh, areas that are threatened by sea level rise who think this is great uh, because this is going to save their country. And there's other people who are afraid that it's going to interrupt the monsoon that their economy and their way of life depends on, and they are not happy about it. Um, and um, so I think that's a fairly realistic depiction of... Um, of uh, of what would happen if somebody began to do this, uh, and I think um, the the best way to to to, to cover it in in a, a, a book is to um, to show that um, and not try to put put one's thumb on the scale. I'm going to let Stuart have the closing question um, since uh, he's he's been gracious enough to do the sorting here, um, and he's asking: um, Is is climate change helping humanity think longer term? Oh. <clears throat> Well, it seems like a great way to incentivize that. Um, uh, you know, um, it's uh, you, you can't you can't think about it unless you're thinking long term. Because if you if you're not thinking long term, you're just talking about the weather. Um, and so, and we've all had the conversation with the surly uncle at Thanksgiving dinner, saying, you know. You know, uh, it was cold last night. I guess that disproves all of this global warming nonsense. Um, you know, uh, and so um, so we kind of have to. It's you know, I, I suppose it's a uh, uh, you know a, a kind of a potentially Darwin Award moment for the whole species uh, in in a certain way. Um, hopefully we hopefully we don't win the award. <laughs> Indeed. Well, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, yeah. pleasure. Yeah. 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 Thanks, y'all.